you got to be all in. Yeah. Like playing poker, you got to look at your hand, whoever you are, if you're whatever culture you come from, whatever male, like female, binary, whatever you see yourself as, whatever you look in the mirror and identify as, you got to look at the hand you've been given and you got to say, I've got a lot to say and I'm in it to win it. And you got to put your chips in and say, I'm all in, I'm all in, and I'm going to keep going until I die. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Jason Schumann, man. How you doing, Jason? Hey, good. Great to be back, Alex. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Yes, this is your first time on the Bulletproof Screening Podcast, but you are a friend of the show from Indie Film <laughs> Hustle back in the day. Uh, we we did, uh, when I did my, I think it was my first Sundance uh, interviews when I was at Sundance doing interviews and you were one of my, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, talk to you while you were there with Rebel in the Rye. Man, that was a, for me, that was an amazing Sundance. My favorite Sundance that I'd ever experienced. It was oh. so great. And it was the shining outside. It was snowing so much yeah. that season, that year. It was like, like with no joke, was like a, like a, a di- deluge of, of snow outside. It was insane how crazy well, it, was. it was. It was special because uh, I loved Rebel and working with yeah. Danny Strong. And so I was so proud of the movie. But also because... I had so many friends that wanted to come to be at the, the movie premiere. So I rented this like house and it was like about 14 of my friends, some who brought their wives. So it was couples and it was like a fraternity house. I had there were like four rooms and the rooms had bunk beds in it. So there were like husbands and wives sleeping together in bunk beds all. So if there was this, I had a great sort of thing and it's- I was like, hey, look, all I can promise you is if you come with me everywhere, I can get you in. If you roam on your own, good luck to you. And so everyone was like, it was like my little entourage I had the whole time. It was best. It was you a re- great sun. Do you remember, do you remember where we, um, where we did the interview in that, in that penthouse, in that kind of like penthouse area? It was like, it was like that. Oh, yeah. That's where I was staying. So, <laughs> and it's, it is like this kind of, ca- it's camp for grownups. Going yeah. to Sundance is like camp for grownups. If you stay anywhere within the vicinity of Main Street, you, unless you're rolling really hard and you're one of the big stars yeah. and you get your own private everything, but generally, sure. but, but generally, there's just no space. So that you have no. to, you got people, you know, who are very high end, like people in the in the industry, big producers and directors and actors, and they're they're doing exactly what you said. They're in sleeping bags. They're on the corner somewhere in a mat. They're like the two of them in a bunk, but like it's it's no like one camp. care. They're just happy to be here. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is such an it's just an amazing experience, and I can't wait to actually yeah. experience it. Hopefully, after it'll be it back, you know. Hopefully, uh, after it. But so before we get started, um, can you tell the audience how you got into the business? Because you have a unique path to your screenwriting side. Well, I mean, I look. I was I was a film geek. Since I was 10 years old, I was riding my bike to the mall to see everything and anything. I had a note from my mom that and the movie theaters knew me to let me see R-rated movies if I wanted to, because I had that note that would never fly today, by the way. <laughs> like, <No>. um, <laughs> so I was just a little film geek dreaming of coming to Hollywood and making movies. And and my dream was to go to USC film school. So when I got in. Uh, I thought like the heavens had parted and like I was anointed the next coming. And then you get to orientation and you realize so did the other 60 people that got in. Everyone felt the same way. So you kind of have to have a big wake up call and say, all right, you know what? I'm just an 18 year old freshman. Time to work. And uh, so I, I got to go to USC film school and meet the most incredible group of friends that I still am very close with to this day. And I had a wonderful experience there. Got to do internships because I was living at USC and you get to be so close to Hollywood. And so I don't know. I was just doing everything and anything, making movies on the weekends, doing internships on days I didn't have classes. And one of my internships led to uh, uh, an internship with a guy named Arnold Copelson, who passed away two years ago. But 
that was a big thing because he was he was a huge producer at the time. Huge. He, huge. he had won an Oscar for Platoon. He had just a couple years earlier had had The Fugitive, which was right. not only a box office hit, but got nominated for an Oscar. And he was in the middle of making Seven, Devil's Advocate, Eraser. He's like, amazing. He's amazing. So many outbreak. And so there I was interning for this for this company, this man. He had this huge production company, Warner Brothers. And so I felt like I had I was like the king of the world, even though I was just making copies and getting coffee. And that led to a, um, a job when I graduated. So I got some of my first, you know, big break coming out of there. But to be honest, I kind of had wanted to be a writer director, as we all do. And we but because I was offered this job, everyone was like, well, why don't you just take it? You can just learn. What do I know? I'm 22 years old. So I took the job and I spent a couple of years there and it was a great sort of induction into the business from a, re you know, film school is not real reality. No, stop it. Stop it. Movie. Stop it. You mean to tell me when you're out in the real world, they don't talk about Kurosawa all the time? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite freshman year, my buddy Herb Ratner, still a close friend. He goes, he calls me up. It's like a Tuesday night. And he goes, man, there's like a sneak preview of Philadelphia with with Denzel and Tom Hanks. We, we got to go. And I was like, I have a geology test tomorrow. And he's like, what are you talking about? You know, who cares about the geology? Just, Let's go see this movie. And I was like, you're right. I'm a college <laughs> student now. I don't have to study for this geology. test." That, that, so my 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 going rogue as a college student was not going to that party and getting drunk on Tuesday night. It was like going to the man's Chinese and seeing a sneak preview. That to me was like being the being rebel. rebel. You, this was your yeah. animal house. This was your animal yeah. house. <laughs> so there was a lot of that in college, a lot of sneaking off. Uh, so, um, uh, so I worked for Arnold for many years and, and rose up there. And then I had this most amazing, opportunity uh, to start my own production company with a guy named William Sherrick. Uh, and so we went off and I quit. I quit that job. I went and we started to make some movies. And one of the uh, original ones was Darkness Falls, which mm -hmm. I can't believe now was like 18 years ago. Um, and if, and, so and if, I, if I can stop you for a second, because when we spoke the first time, uh, I actually know the story of Darkness Falls, how it got produced. I'm like when my co-host was with me, uh, Sebastian. He was like, "How do you know that?" I'm like, "Dude, I'm a, I'm a film geek. <laughs> and any story about a filmmaker who made it, like any, because that was a lottery ticket. Essentially, he had a great short that Jonathan yeah, yeah. He had a great short that got picked up, and then they turned it into a feature, which then was a big hit uh, at the time. And I was like, of course I know that story. Every, you know, if, if, if you have to know that, so it's kind of like the El Mariachis and the Clerks, and like he was one of those. Yeah. He was one of those guys that had that that window. Yeah, so it was great. He's also like uh, the, he's was he is and was the nicest guy, Jonathan. He became close friend of William and I's, and so it was a magical experience because we go off and make this movie. We're all in our mid twenties, and we shot it in Australia and. And anyway, we bring it back and the studio didn't know what they sent these three guys off doing. And then they just put it. God bless Tom Sherrick, who who was like, let's put it out on Super Bowl weekend. And everyone was like, Super Bowl weekend. That's a two day weekend. No one goes to the movies on Super Bowl Sunday. And he's like, yeah, but there's no competition. So we came out in 2003 Super Bowl weekend and we were number one for this little movie. And that sort of helped William and I uh, get a, a deal at the studio. And, and, and then we were off to the races making a bevy of movies over the next 10 years. And, and we just flying over genres like we did The Messengers, Sony. We did Little Black Book. We did Role Models. We, did, we were just hopping all over the place with comedies, with horror, with romantic movies, some family movies. So it was a great run i really loved it now let me ask you a question though how as a as a producing team or as a production company yeah the the the, the standard 
frame of thought is to pigeonhole yourself or at least it's, 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 you're you're the whore, like bloom house he's the, like you can't yeah. bloom house you know slaps the comedy i'm not gonna probably go see but um yeah. <laughs> I, maybe i would because i'd be curious on how he does it but generally as, as a production company or as a producer you kind of want to niche yourself like arnold was an action he was the yeah. action dude he was the action he was like he reminded me very much of joel silver like him and yeah. and joel were in turn or as well yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a, we have to have a conversation about that another day. Um, but uh, but yeah, those kind of guys. So you were jumping all. I saw. I mean, when looking at your IMDb, you're everywhere. Like role models, horror. Like it's all over the place. That's my own fault, and probably to my own detriment because we had we came right out of the gate with two fairly successful horror movies in Darkness Falls and The Messengers. And we were getting a lot of offers for people like, come make horror here, come make horror there. But the truth is, I'm just I I love movies and I love stories and I love all kinds of movies like I, I'm just not uh, I, I see everything. I don't care small, big, which genre you are. Um, I see it all indie movies. And and I just was like, William, I can't sit in another meeting and talk about the mythology of these of the ghosts and what their motivations are. and. I, I started to become creatively stagnant because, you know, yeah, we had two made in a row and they were hits, but we probably developed 15 others at the time. Right. So I was right. in so many meetings and reading so many scripts having to do with this thing and that thing. You know, Blumhouse came later and certainly he grabbed that with Paranormal and he wrote it. And that's probably what William and I should have done. <laughs> but. I was so excited to read Little Black Book. I was so excited to read Bangkok Dangerous, so excited to deal with being meetings on role models and talk about like the big set pieces because I loved Judd Apatow and I, our offices were right next to Judd Apatow. And I was like, but I want to make movies like him too. So it's That's great. Just of my own wanting to flex the, the, that muscle of like being just telling different kinds of stories. So that's what we just kept doing. And, and it seems to have worked out okay for you. You've done, yeah, you, you've no done no okay. Complaint. No complaints. It's, it's like, and I think once you set yourself up as either, I mean, for screenwriters, would you recommend screenwriters stay kind of on, on, a, on a genre at the beginning? So at least they kind of put themselves in that box and then they can kind of spread out. Like once you're Aaron Sorkin, you can write whatever you want. Once you're Shane Black, you can pretty much write whatever you want. Um, but at the beginning, the town kind of likes to know what you are. If you're a horror guy, you're a horror guy. If you're a comedy guy, you're a comedy guy. Because your reps need to know how to sell you. They need to know how to introduce you to the town. And that is done easier for them and for you if you kind of like, this is the guy I, I want to make the next Blumhouse movies or I want to be the next Judd Apatow. If you can kind of sell yourself that way, it just makes their job easier, whatever that is. Right. Whatever. But as a year. but you actually because you were jumping all over the place that became kind of your brand, like oh he he does everything. <laughs> That's what people don't. Understand. They're like, well, you, yeah, you you can look at my IMDb and you're like Jesus. But I I I you have to understand when I went in to make Daddy Day Camp, which <laughs> seems funny now, right? But Sony called uh, William and I and said, would you be interested in producing it? I like the kid in me is like I grew up on those Herbie the Love Bug movies and camp movies like Meatballs and I was just like wait a second I am going to submerse myself in camp movies and I am going to try to make the greatest camp movie for the this generation of 8 to 12 year olds so it's like you think like well, Schumann why would you go off and make Daddy Day Camp it's like well because to me that was an exciting opportunity to give kids of that generation a camp mm -hmm. movie that maybe they would watch over and over again. And I went nuts. Mm -hmm. I watched so many camp movies, not just the ones that I remembered. I was trying to submerse myself in what made camp movies fun, what kids would want to see today. So it's like, even though the result may have not been this beloved, like legendary camp movie, that was the attempt. That was and, and that goes for everything when we were making Bangkok Dangerous, you know, it's like or we were thought we were making we tried to make an action movie that could parallel, you know, the action movies that, that and we thought there would be like this was Bangkok Dangerous. Then there would be like Shanghai Dangerous. Then there would be 
we we were trying to set up so people have to understand sometimes it works like role models lone survivor or etc and sometimes it just you tried everything and it just fell a little short it's not like you didn't work any harder right. you, you didn't try any more to make it a great movie so yeah. you just put them out there and go let's see what happens <laughs> let's gotcha. see what <laughs> <laughs> now, so when we spoke, um, uh, when we spoke at Sundance uh, those years ago, you were at that point talking about getting into screenwriting, and that yeah. you were moving to New York to to work with uh, to work with Danny. I think you, Danny, with Danny Strong, and um, and kind of just like you know, go under his wing a little bit. You were telling us just like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn yeah. how to be a screenwriter. So, what made you jump from being a producer? to wanting to go into the very um, non-competitive world of screenwriting? <laughs> well, there's many things. It's just you get a little older and you start to say to yourself, how do I want to keep challenging? But there was also that kid in me who, look, I, I had a, what William and I got to do at the young age, we got to do it. And the yeah. opportunities I had learning from Arnold at, at 22 years old, I wouldn't take that back for anything, but there was that 14, 15 year old in me that was like, but I wanted to, I wanted to write. I wanted to create stories from the beginning, not just sit with writers uh, who I, and I love and respect good, good screenwriting. So I thought either I put my money where my mouth is and see if I have it in me or, or just, you know, go and continue to be a producer and keep trying to evolve uh, that way. And Dan it was Danny who called me and said, I want you to drop everything and I want you to move to New York. And I just want you to like come meet with me every day uh, and just uh, let's talk screenplays. Let I want you to write and I'm going to read your stuff and I'm going to critique it and I'm just going to give you a boot camp. And I was like, how can wow. I turn this down? That's how, amazing. How can I turn? <laughs> I mean, we had been pals since 18, since USC film school, but like. Danny at that time was was at the like he had just won every award for game change and the, he had the butler coming out and he he hadn't even created Empire yet. Which I got to be sitting there with him while he wrote the pilot for Empire. That was pretty cool. He kept like turning his computer going like, is it me or does this scene seem really fun to you? And I'd read it and it'd be like Cookie doing something <laughs> like amazing. he had the vision for Cookie way, way at the beginning. So. Uh, I owe it all to Danny. Like, really, he I did. I did it. What he said, I, I I left my life in Los Angeles and I moved to New York and I sat and wrote every day with him. He texted me in the morning. Here's the cafe I'll be at. I'd show up. I would do my stuff. He'd be doing his stuff at lunch. I'd ask him a bunch of questions when I was ready to show him stuff. He'd read it. And he was brutal. He was brutal with me, but it was helpful. Um, he'd give me all the ways he approached writing, all the sort of mottos that he would take, how he approached a blank page, how he would approach characters, how he would approach everything. And I just tried to make that habit. And it took a while. He, it was a year and a half of writing, handing him stuff and him wow. shitting on it. And <laughs> finally, finally, after a year and a half, he, he, he thought that maybe I had morphed myself into a, a writer who could be consistent i don't think he was looking for a good scene here and there he was looking for consistency he was looking for like my storytelling to have evolved to a place where he felt like now i could go off and and maybe sell some stuff or 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 had honed my voice i mean that's a hell of a friend i gotta say yeah one of the greatest things he taught me so any screenwriters listening was he was like, sit down and write, write down a list of things you love and things you hate, like things, things that anger you, because that, that's where recount came for him. It's like it's like he hated that election process, the 2000 election. He was angry about the outcome and it really boiled his blood. And so, you know, then he goes and buys some books and reads about the Florida recount. And that turns into a story that he outlines. And so I, that was a big thing for me. You know, like if you look at a lot of the projects I'm working on now, um, this show I have at Apple, 
uh, uh, Eduardo and I are writing Short Circuit, uh, my yeah. HBO show about the Lakers. It's all stuff in the 80s because one of the things I wrote down on that when I would do those exercises is I love the 80s. Of course. I just do. Yeah. I, that was my era. I love the music. I love the television. I love the movies. I love the campiness. I love the outfits. I love my memories. I like what malls looked like. I like just the, and so it, that list he had me do really reverberated in the work, not all the work that I've done in the last four or five years, but a lot of it is like things that really anger me or things that I just love so much that I want to live in that world and, and with those characters. So that was it just, Every I could we could do a whole couple hours on the Danny Strong method and how <laughs> how well it works, but uh, it really was. I'm not sure. Amazing. I'm I'm not sure everybody can afford that that uh, that that seminar for a year and a half. And I'm not sure Danny has the bandwidth to 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 to. to, to no, I, could, I, I know. I know. Around. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> You should you should actually call Danny like Danny. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put out a seminar. It's gonna be called the Danny Strong Method. I I'm not paying you anything, unfortunately. But What's but thank you, Danny Strong. <laughs> That's amazing. So you said something really interesting. Like, how do you approach a blank page? How is there is there is there are there some tips? Because that is the most one of the most daunting things a writer has to do is. And it's not a page anymore. It's that blinking cursor, generally speaking. Yeah. So how do you approach a blank screen? Uh, this is, it, it was, Danny had always sort of taught me that don't get it right, get it written. I don't care if it's the worst scene you've written in the world. And Eduardo subscribes to that same theory. So when I started working with Eduardo, it was nice to see that, like, I have friends, I have very successful screenwriter friends who they'll spend a whole day on that one page till they get it perfect and God bless them. But I found that what Danny's method and Eduardo's method, which is just, just write the worst version of the scene. I don't care because the rewriting to us is the fun part. So I feel like I've written the most amateurish, worst, awful scenes that I wouldn't show like my closest friends. But then you go back and you, immediately start to realize how lazy it is, how cheesy the dialogue is. But at least you're not looking at a blank page anymore. Yeah. At least you're looking at some semblance of a scene. And somehow, even if you're rewriting the whole thing from scratch, it somehow, to me, makes it mentally easier if I'm rewriting a scene that exists than, than staring at that blank page. So that's what I've always done these last couple of years i mean for my I, I i can't agree with you more i always find the rewriting process so much easier than the writing process for me and when i'm like i write a lot of i write my books and and i do my i write like obscenely amounts and from my pot my blogs and stuff but it's just starting sucks <laughs> but it sucks, it sucks. But the rewriting part, so sometimes I'm writing, I'm like, this sucks. I know it sucks. I'm just going to keep, yep, that, oh, that was horrible. Let me just keep going. This is, this is, this is atrocious. I'll never let anyone read this and I'll just keep going. And then the next morning I'll come back. I'm like, okay, this is exactly what I thought it was really had, but why don't we do this? Yeah. And why don't we move over this over here? And then let me rewrite this. Oh, I have a brand new, th this really bad paragraph that I wrote has now set me on another path in my mind to write a brand new paragraph that has nothing to do with the old paragraph, but it's a complete rewrite from basically and just go. Yeah. So it's, it's, it keeps, it keeps the thing flowing. It keeps the thing. It's kind of like editing. I mean, I've been an editor for 20 odd years. So like when you edit the scene, you edit a horrible, just, get, horrible. just, just cut it, just cut it. Yeah. It's master shot theater. There's no nuance. Yeah. In it. <laughs> get it up there. Then you could start slicing and dicing. Same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish, you know, a lot of writers beat themselves up and look, everyone has their process. Everyone approaches it however they want. This works for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the tidbits that Danny's taught me, or at least the ones that I retain are that way because I think they spoke to me. But like, I remember I showed up one day and I got a terrible sleep and I was just kind of groggy. And I was like, ah, Danny, I don't know if I feel it today. And he's like, doesn't matter. Keep writing. And I'm like, oh, I got like two hours of sleep. And he's like, let me tell you something. When you read your screenplay, you got 126 pages of crap that you're ready to sit down and read through. 
you won't remember which scene you wrote on that day when you came and you're like, oh, I feel great today. And, I'm ready. <laughs> and you won't remember which scenes you felt great about and which scenes, because it's all just sort of blends in. Mm-hmm. So the goal every day should just get those two pages done, get those three pages each day. Just get that done. Because in, when you stack it all together, you probably won't even remember. And it probably won't even be as bad, just like on those days where you think you wrote brilliance. Right. And then you go read it the next day. You're like, wasn't that brilliant? I mean, I walked away. <laughs> I walked away the day before thinking like, man, what a great day of writing. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's never <laughs> as good as you thought it was. And it's also never as bad as you thought it was. And so just keep doing it. Just keep writing. Don't let yourself give excuses and just kind of keep powering forward. And like that, that's what makes Danny Danny, because it's like, yeah, I think he's right. Yeah. And I think it's I I always find it to be better to be prolific than to be perfect. Yeah. There's a lot of directors, a lot of screenwriters out there who just put out stuff and they're not all home runs, but a lot of them couple might be strikeouts, but there's a lot of singles, a yeah. lot of doubles, a lot of triples, and there's maybe a one or two home run situation in there. If I may, if I may be as cliche as to use a baseball metaphor uh, with yeah. it, but I, but I always find it it works. Baseball metaphors work. That's why they're so cliche. <laughs> one of my favorite stories uh, from Forrest Gump, because I got to work with this guy, Charles Newworth, who was the UPM line producer on Forrest Gump. And he said, like, Zemeckis had been talking about the shot he wanted to get and It took like six hours to set up and they could only do it during a certain time of the day. And so they get it all ready. They're rehearsing it. They go to shoot the scene. Not quite what he wanted. And he just turned to to Charles and went, they can't all be gems. (laughs) Can't all be gems. But when you mix it in with Forrest Gump, there's so many great things about it. Does it matter that, that not everything is, and I try to remember that they can't all be gems, but if you've got enough gems in there, it'll be good stuff. It sparkles. It will sparkle. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now as a, you know, obviously you've been around town for, for a while. You've been working in town. Uh, when you started to go out as a screenwriter, how did the town respond to you as, you know, because everyone used GJ, because this town is very, loves boxes and loves putting people in boxes. Yeah. So yeah. when you came out from, hey, I, you've been a successful producer, but here's my script I need you to read. <laughs> that yeah. I, how did the town respond to you? I'm curious. Um, I, I had to fight that. I had to uh, convey my conviction in my heart and soul that, that this was like not just a thing I was trying, that this was a full commitment that I was making that I wasn't looking to just sort of dabble my foot in it. And I, I, I meant it when, when I packed up and moved to New York, I was like, I'm all in. Um, and so I had to convey that this was not just some hobby. And I was hoping that I was going to succeed by hook or by crook. And so, yeah, I had to deal with it was nice that w- when agents would read it and they didn't know who I was because I'm not I'm not Brian Grazier. I'm not Jules. <laughs> Like not everybody knew who I was. So uh, I ended up having some when I started sending my material out to agencies, tried to send it to people I thought maybe didn't know who I was, but who I knew and admired. And so those were some initial meetings that went really well. And um, I, I did. I was honest with them that I have a producing career, but I'm hoping I'm hoping that my knowledge and my background of producing will only make me a better a more better writer especially in television where tv or tv show running and tv writing a lot of it is producing too mm-hmm. uh i i um i've hung around enough at tv shows to see that the, the showrunner half your job is overseeing the writers and the other half is dealing with the network and the studio and dealing with the the politics of and and that is in itself producing. So uh, I knew I could combine both in a way that could be advantageous to the writing. And then along the way, I almost wanted to call up every writer I've ever worked with as a producer and say, I'm so sorry that you had to take notes from me 
because now that I've given myself a grad school in screenwriting and I feel like I understand screenwriting so much better now than when I did as a producer, I'm like, you had to sit there and listen to my notes. Like, and now I feel like I was just talking out of my ass. Like, how did I not do this sooner? At least sort of dive into screenwriting. I feel it makes you a better producer to sort of understand the nuances of not only being a writer, but just on how story works and structure and characters. And God, it's just like, it's just crazy to me that, that uh, the way this town is built where you could get a, a, a really good job like I was given right out of college and <laughs> shoved in a room with million dollar writers and have Arnold Copelson go like, Jason, read this script, meet with, me with that million dollar writer, give them notes. And they have to listen to me. And they're very cordial and respectful because I represent Arnold Copelson. But I'm like thinking back upon that now. And I'm like, what was I? <laughs> I should call those people up and be like, thank you for not just being like, you're a biggest moron, Jason. Who sent you into this room? And that's, isn't that amazing? But that is, that is the way this town works. It is just ridiculous that. There's a huge producer, a legendary huge producer, who sends in a 20-something and goes, I, I kind of like, I, I, I trust your taste, Jason. Go read it, and then go talk to this million-dollar-plus screenwriter and give him notes, who's, yeah. been, who's written probably 30 or 40 screenplays in his life, probably yeah. even more. You've never written one, uh, and, you've re and you've read maybe five. So... <laughs> Maybe 10. I'm being generous. So give, yeah. him your, give him your notes based on the video store experience you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would do that. I would prepare all night. I'd be like, in order to make this character more three dimensional, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. And I was prepared. And yeah. I worked on it. But Jesus Lord. What, what were, like, okay. All right. I guess my youthful, like, fake it till you make it kind of stuff had to wow. take over. <laughs> and that and that's you know that's a really good lesson for screenwriters listening today because you're gonna deal with young jasons uh and and by the way jason's yeah. one of the nicer ones uh that I've, I've i've ever met in this business but you're gonna get you know we all deal with people who are put in positions of power that don't have they shouldn't be there and yeah. especially talking to creatives who might know it's i mean it's just, it's the oldest i mean mank i mean you, you know, mank just came out i mean I know. I mean, so you, it's it's been happening since the dawn of our industry. Someone just said, you know, someone told Chaplin, you know, when you fall, it's not really ringing true. So can you put the banana peel over to the like? There's always someone on that side telling you you're doing yeah. it wrong or wants to put in their stuff. Um, but so how did you deal with how how would you how do you suggest screenwriters deal with notes? Because that is something that every screenwriter, no matter what. Yeah. What level they're at, unless you're Tarantino or or one of these big writer directors who have well, everyone does every yeah Tarantino I mean, aside sure yeah um, look I think one of the skills of the good screenwriters the ones who have a lot of success working within the studio and the network system is learning how to address notes and interpret notes without just being a typist like your job. And I think they expect this of you is not to literally take the notes and just go and do note number one and just go into the document and change it. They're giving you what's bumping them about what you've written and they're trying to articulate it, hoping that you will get it. And that's that is an art form that I'm constantly trying to work on and having Eduardo getting to work with Eduardo makes it easier because we're just two of us so we can talk it through. Uh, you know, people like Danny who works solo, Danny just has an interpretive mind. So he he's like, OK, I, I know what they want. I, I, I can read between the lines. And so I guess it's just something you should if you're a writer, if you have an, a partner or a room that you work in, talk it through. Maybe from talking it out loud, you kind of go, oh, here's OK, I see what they're. And then you bring your own creativity to the note and your changes so that it doesn't mess up the overall tone and, and theme that you were going for, uh, that is an art form in of itself. And if you can become good at interpreting network and studio notes, 
you will be a successful writer. I, I'm still working on it to this day. I do feel like my past as a producer helps. But believe me, there are still plenty of documents I get where I'm like head scratching, like, shit, this is bumping them. But the note is confusing me. It's confusing me. And I don't understand what exactly they want. And sometimes it takes a few days of it and I like talking it through, like, did they mean this? And, I mean, look, if you have a good relationship with them, you can call them and ask them to explain it. But a lot of times we've done that and I'm even more confused. <laughs> exactly. Now, how did we you get, get all... it? Now, how did you get yeah. involved with Eduardo and, and what is it like writing with a partner? You know, cause I'm also a soloist. I, I I've written with partners before and sometimes it's been great. Sometimes it hasn't been good. Uh, Eduardo loves working with you because I had him on the show as well, obviously. So um, he speaks nothing but high, highly of, of you, sir, except off, off air, off, off air, off air. He was destroying you. But on air, he really, really enjoyed working with you. <laughs> so how was it working with uh, how is it working with it with Eduardo and how did you get guys meet? Well, look, Alex, I'll go deep. I have had no luck in my personal social life finding uh like as to my mother's dismay like uh <laughs> finding someone married start yeah. a family yeah not for lack of trying uh i just can't seem to click with with someone out there i know it's harder now we're in a pandemic but even before i can't use that as an excuse somehow in my business world i've had two partnerships me and william sherrick and me and, and eduardo and they both came very naturally. It was not forced. It was not anything. It was like I met William in college. We totally clicked. And then naturally we got we just started working together. There was no sort of like like formal like thing. It just felt so natural that we were yin to each other's yang. Like and and then the same thing with Eduardo. Like I just met him. Uh coincidentally, it was kind of full circle from Copelson because my sort of mentor at Copelson was this executive named Sanford Panich. And he's sort of the opposite of what I was just describing. He was a young executive who was brilliant, just brilliant, even at a young age. And he found Arnold so many of those movies like like uh, Seven and Fugitive and Devil's Advocate and Eraser. He found those scripts and he developed them. And he was like 25, 26 at that Jesus. time. Jesus. It's amazing. He's just, and now he runs, well, he's president of Sony under Tom Rothman, and he's just that good. He's just that good. And um, I was having breakfast with him, and he had read some of my stuff that I had been writing, and he thought it was good, thank God. And um, he said, look, I just signed this deal with this guy, Eduardo Cisneros. He just wrote and produced this massive hit called Instructions Not Included, which Sanford couldn't speak highly enough of. And he said, the guy is like the Judd Apatow of Mexico. He he's created all these hit shows. Now he's created this movie. I just signed an overall deal with him. Why don't you meet him? And if you guys come up with an idea that you can work on together, great. Do it here at Fox. At that time, Sanford was at Fox. And so it was Sanford. He kind of like matchmaker. He's a matchmaker. <laughs> and so we we met in a conference room at Fox and I came with like literally 10 ideas that I had prepared. Yeah. Uh, I was always the Judd Apatow when I had offices near him. He always said like when he worked the comedy clubs and when Sandler would say like, hey, man, could you write me like three jokes? And he would write like 20 jokes because he just wanted to show Sandler like that he was up for the challenge that like he wasn't going to waste this opportunity. So that always kind of like OK, I'm going to come prepared every time. And I wrote down 10 ideas uh, and I pitched them all to him and Eduardo hated all of them. So then we were like, well, then we just started shooting the shit and then we just started talking. And then uh, I, 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 I somehow stumbled on a germ of an idea that he was interested in, but it was not fleshed out. And then we ended up meeting for coffee another day talking about the idea more, which led to more meetings. And then we eventually took the idea to Sanford. He bought it. And then we were able to write our first script together. And I'm, I'm not kidding. It's kind of like it was so easy. It was so natural right. that like his strengths 
were my weaknesses, vice versa. His work ethic was the was mine in terms of like, you know, being available for each other. We didn't have other stuff going on that like uh, that frustrated each of us. And so it was such a, a wonderful process that when that was over, he was like, hey, I've had this other idea. Maybe we could work on it together. And we ended up selling that as a TV show to Fox. Didn't get made, but we got to write another thing together. And then during that is when he said, like, hey, I have this idea for this movie called Half Brothers. And then he's like, and we just pitched that one together. So it just happened very naturally where where there was never like an official, hey, let's shake on it. We're We're working. We're a writing team. (laughs) It just happened naturally. And so I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful to the the universe that in my work life, they've brought me two partnerships that have just been magical, where in my personal life, I'm like still waiting, (laughs) still dealing with the phone calls from my mother being like, when? Oh my when? God. I dealt with that so much that my mom, my mother actually uh, connected me with my wife. She actually matched make me with my wife, believe it or not. And it worked. It worked. By the way, <laughs> it was a swing and a miss of a handful of times before my wife showed up. But it was. That's your mother. Oh, man. On that. <laughs> yeah, because it was like every time she would try to hook me up with someone, I'm like, this is, do you even know who I am? Like, why did you, why would you send her to me? <laughs> like, this makes no sense. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's great. And then as a, as a writing, I mean, cause you wrote by yourself for a little while before you started writing with a partner. So yeah, when you're writing with a partner, what Eduardo said at least was that you guys just kind of, you be, you have, you have someone to bounce ideas off of and you can kind of bounce things back and forth. A lot of people have asked me what don't, don't you get frustrated because I have my own voice. As a writer, I have all my life experience that I bring to it. Do you get frustrated? And I could see how people could ask that because when you're just up by yourself, you know, you, you, you maybe get frustrated with yourself, but you're not arguing over this joke's funnier, that joke's funnier. Um, but I, 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 I think that with Eduardo and I, uh, we just haven't had that issue. It's been a total sort of, Two, one plus one equals 10. We feel like we get 10 times more done. We're not hurting each other's voice. Sure, do we argue about like, I think that's funny and he doesn't think it's funny sure. or vice versa, but we just let it go. Fine, keep your joke. Um, uh, early on, I, Eduardo, in getting to know him, he had such a mission with his writing. You know, my mission was just to try to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, I just w- grew up, Jerry Seinfeld, David Letterman, Mel Brooks. I just I just wanted to make the world laugh. I didn't have spe- the specificity that Eduardo did with, with, with he not only wants to make the world laugh, but he wanted to change the stereotype of La- I'll say Latinx people for him specifically Mexico, but he really had a goal with his laughter. And that changed my world, to be honest, Alex, because I had just sort of grown up thinking like, well, laughter is the best medicine. Right. But to meet Eduardo and have him talk about, yeah, I want to make people laugh, but I also want to create characters that defy the stereotypes. And I'd like to to right. do it by sort of like putting cheese on the broccoli. Like maybe we can change hearts and minds by creating positive latinx stereotypes yeah like having characters that would normally just be a white doctor or a a lawyer or a successful businessman but why can't we make a mexican cuban south american and somehow the comedy can just come and, and somehow people will laugh and see the movie but then they'll walk away not realizing that like oh it was a a latino character that wasn't just a gardener a maid uh, a, a narcos, uh, uh, right. you know, and so when when he started to talk to me about that, it was to me I was like, sign me up, Eduardo, si- sign me up because I, I want to go on that mission with you. Uh, yeah. So teach me, help me understand where the last many decades have gone wrong in in their portrayal of, of, of Latino characters, and let's try to. Let's try to impa- make a positive impact that's that amazing. way. So that, that's amazing. The, 
it brought a whole nother depth to what I was just thinking. I'm just going to be another funny Jewish guy to being, to having a, more of a purpose to the writing uh, in an entertaining way. Obviously, first and foremost, we're trying to entertain. Sure. Uh, and so uh, with that goal in mind, can we also elevate what we're trying to do? That's a, if you can combine those two things in your professional life and your creative life, that is a very honorable way to, uh, to, to approach it. It really, truly is. I mean, for me, I mean, I, I'm Cuban and the only two main Cuban influences in pop culture are Ricky Ricardo and Scarface, who happens to be Italian. So, right. uh, you know, so and for years, you know, like, hey, man, how you doing, man? Like, it was constantly that throughout, I mean, when I was growing up, you know, because Scarface was, is the 80s. By the way, n nothing against Mr. Palm. I think Scarface is a fantastic film. Um, and yeah. I think Pacino did a fantastically um, a performance of what it was. It's a, it's a bit over the top. I'm just saying, just a bit over the top. It and it's a, yeah. Just a bit, but he's Al Pacino. Um, but, it's, but it's true. And, and, and I think now with what's going on in the world and, there is a lot more awareness of of bringing these kind of characters, and I think you guys are at the forefront. And I can't wait to actually see Half Brothers. But from the trailer, uh, it looks hilarious. Like I, I'm like I told my wife about it. I'm like we got to watch this when this comes out. This is going to be amazing. Uh, thank you. I I love the movie. It was everything Eduardo and I wanted to do when we set out to write it, to produce it, and bring on the team of Luke and Luis. Like uh, it's um. I'm so proud to have been able to make a movie like this that is very contemporary. Very. Um, we think, but also follows the classic structure of movies that I grew up loving, like Planes, Trains, and Automobiles yep. I, I, yeah. in Iran. Um, I mean, I, I worship these movies and I've watched them hundreds of times. So to get to kind of live in the genre of some of my all-time favorites but try to create a modern movie with also the intention of like what we were saying to to just change the stereotype a little bit, change the perception. Uh, so it was it was a fulfilling experience from top to bottom. You know, you know, what's funny is when I was watching the trailer and I saw that scene with when he's running towards the car with the goat. Um, by the way, everyone, you can see the trailer at the, at the show notes. So yeah. it doesn't sound like we're like talking weird, but uh, definitely watch the trailer. But when he's running towards it, go the first image that popped in my head. I don't know why it was planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> like I just like it just it just felt very John Huey to me, which was great. And I was like, oh, now that you said that, it makes all the sense in the world because you can see that 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 kind of tang to it. It uh, it has a flavor of of those kind of old Midnight Run, especially Midnight yeah. Run. I just recently watched Midnight Run again. It's the so, first movie, I it's think. So it's so great. Oh my God, Groat and and, and oh. well, thank you. I consider anything, any even if one little moment in a movie that I'm a part of reminds you of John Hughes, like <laughs> we're good. Yeah, I'll take it because that's <laughs> I don't. I could never make planes, trains if I tried. It's such a sure. brilliant movie. Um, but uh, we we just tried to bring the funny and the heart and the warmth and the characters that were that could make it an entertaining movie and still take you on a trip and take you on a journey. And so uh, we, we can have another conversation after you watch. So I'll come back anytime. <laughs> I can't wait. No, I can't wait. I, I can't wait to see it. Um, and, um, oh, God, you just made me lose my train of thought. Um, we were talking about John Hughes. Um, all right, I forgot it. We'll go on to the next question. Um, so with, um, with Half Brothers, uh, and, and you obviously now sitting on both sides of the table as a producer and as a screenwriter, what advice do you have for screenwriters on approaching uh, a project, approaching a producer? How, what does that screenplay, ha how does that screenplay have to be? How should they approach it? What's the do's and do nots? Should we just show up at your house and knock on the door with a screenplay? I mean, I heard that's the way it's done in Hollywood. I've seen it in <laughs> movies. <laughs> How is it? How do you, how do you look at it? Choosing a producer, it's it. You know, you got to be careful because yeah. there are a lot of producers around uh, around town, and like I don't know. And, and can we use the can we use air quotes with the words producers? Right. Because if I, 
can hit a producer. But also, you could just go down a, to uh, the FedEx store and uh, or UPS store and get a business card made up and say you're a producer. <laughs> There's no accreditation for it. That's the scary the part. Producer is so important right. because, as I've learned, if they give up on your script, it's good as dead. Like the producer has to keep that boulder being pushed up the mountain. You, a screenwriter, uh, you know, unless you happen to have a a, 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 a a career as producing like I had luckily done. So we sold in this case, we sold the pitch to focus. There were no producers attached at the time, but I knew what to do as far as how to get keep the studio as as we kept doing drafts and we got Luis attached to star and we got Luke interested in directing. That was me just instinctually taking over and saying, I've got a script that I'm really proud of. And I think there's a movie here. I'm just going to keep putting it together. So when it came time to the studio saying, like, I think we're going to make this, then they were just like, well, why don't you just produce it? Why don't you and Eduardo just produce it since you've kind of been acting as producer anyway? So that was just a lucky situation where I turned to Eduardo and I was like, wow, that's that was easy. We get to make it ourselves. Um, but I do, I do, um, really, um, uh, I don't take for granted good producing because mm. even in my writing career, I've, I've now been able to work with producers, um, that I'm like, they have skills that I don't have as a producer. I, I think they are, they help me see things that I'd like to do in my producing game and, and people that I just respect immensely. And so if you're a screenwriter and you've got a script like you can you can either take your chance on a young ish producer or a new producer if they have a lot of excitement for your script. Um, but don't 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 uh, don't sell your soul away. Like if, if they drop the ball, you got to be willing to change it up right. because you can, it can just sit dormant with a producer who's kind of given up on it. Um and then it's just uh, if you go with a big company, like a big Brian Grazier type company, well, they're great and Brian's amazing, but you're probably going to be dealing with their executives, which is OK, too. Just make sure that you get along with them. Make sure that you have a rapport with that executive and you feel like this executive's got your back and is has the same vision of you do of trying to get it where it needs to be. There's no right answer, Alex. <laughs> because every producer is going to have a different set of skills. They're going to have different contacts. Like, right. I only know the people that I know. Right. So right. if you bring me your script, I know the agents that I've known for 20 years. I know the talent that I know. And I have a way of doing things. That might be totally different than somebody else who's, like, been doing it the same amount of time I have and their connections are totally different. So the attachments that they might pitch you, the agents they might talk to. So it's sort of an instinctual thing. You got to meet with producers. You got to hope there's enthusiasm. You got to look into their eyes, male or female, and you got to say, I trust them. I got a good feeling. Um, you know, it, it, I'll bring another Danny Strong story. When, when, when he wrote Recount, and HBO was like, Danny, like, who do you want to team up with on this movie? Because Sidney Pollack, who was the original director producer of Recount, passed away like months before they were going to go shoot. And so Danny was given carte blanche to like team up with so many different. And if I named you some of the directors, oh, you'd I'm be sure. like, Lord. But he met with Jay Roach and Jay Roach at the time. This is before Jay Roach has gone on now to do a bevy of dr dramatic work that's yeah. amazing. But at the time, he had had the Meet the Parents movies and the Austin Powers movies. But Danny met with him, and I'm going to steal his story. He'll tell it much better. But he just said, I met with him, and I was like, this guy's a winner. This guy, it's like, could I go with some of these other people who have more dramatic stuff on their resume that I admire too. Sure. But I sat there with Jay and there was just something about this meeting where I was like, yes, I want to, t I want to go down a road with this guy. I want, I, I just, this guy's a winner and everything he touches turns to gold and I'm in. And 
that was just Danny's instincts. That was just mm-hmm. Danny's mm-hmm. instincts saying like, I, I, you could talk me out of it, but, but I'm not going to let you because, and I feel like that's what, as a writer, you got to send your stuff out there. You got to be fearless in that. And then the meetings you take, if somebody seems shady, if somebody <laughs> seems a little suspect, don't do it. Don't do it. But that doesn't don't. happen. That doesn't happen in Hollywood, Jason. I mean, everyone here is so nice and upfront and they right. don't do anything shady here. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. That's sarcasm. If anyone did not pick up on the sarcasm, that's sarcasm. I'm just letting you know. Both, de- both Jason and I have gray hair for a reason. <laughs> I was always taught like a good deal. Uh, with a bad person is a bad deal. Yes. I mean, and a bad yes. deal with a good person is a great deal. And I don't forget that. Like if I meet with somebody and they're offering me less money, but but I just feel like God is su- such a good person. And, and I ask around about them and people speak lovingly. And then there's this other person who just, I don't know, but but they're offering me more money. Ten times out of ten, I'll go with the, the 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 less deal, but with the good person because it it will in the long run it will pay off to me. That's a great great advice, and I just remember what I lost my train of thought. The one thing I was going to say oh, is, yeah. it's so great that Focus Features, you know, is producing films like A Half Brother because in the studio system, um, that's that was very commonplace. But nowadays, yeah, you no, don't. God bless- you don't get films of of this, you know, because Half Brother is not a tentpole. Uh, you know, it's not a two hundred million dollar movie. So oh. generally, the studios that's what they're doing. And now, specifically with the way the world is, like nobody, like what Warner Brothers just released the other day it was just like, holy cow, this is this is changing the game. I mean, who knows yeah. what's going to happen in the next year or two? So it's so cool that they actually are putting so many resources. And it really. Honest. It truly is. It truly is. That was a testament to Eduardo, his work with Eugenio Derbez. Um, You know, that that Eduardo had worked with him not only on instructions, but Latin, how to be a Latin lover, had helped him out with Overboard. And so those movies, Eugenio is a brand. Mm -hmm. So those movies performed really well. Mm -hmm. And um, Focus was willing to take a shot to kind of create their own uh division or at least their attempt to kind of get into that market if we're just talking about from a business standpoint they saw that there is a niche um being yeah. created by eduardo and and Eugenio and ben odell and their company and it was just sort of like and look we're in a pandemic so the movies come out and it's doing fine for pandemic wise we're doing great but you know in a real world the box office would have been more on par with like Latin lover and overboard and instructions, sure. but the world's changed. And so most people will safely watch it uh, on their, uh, on their things. But if they happen to be in, in and around a theater or drive in, I went to the drive in this weekend to watch. It was so fun. Uh, and, but if you're in Phoenix or Texas or Florida or somewhere where there's a theater and you feel safe, you can experience it. How Eduardo and I, intended it to be experienced but eventually it, it will come out and and hopefully still do the same kind of numbers that that those other movies did That's over awesome. the long yeah and i'm gonna ask you a few questions i ask all of my guests sir um yes. what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read <laughs> Number one my first and foremost is network oh so good it's been yeah that's that's been I on that list a lot a lot. I refer to it quite a bit. Um, and it's just brilliant to me in every way, shape and form. I could never use the words so easily that he uses. Uh, uh, so brilliant. I, I really do love uh, Patty Chayefsky as a writer, but also the movie Network. Um, the other ones I sort of flip around from a genre perspective. Um, I love Cameron Crowe's Jerry Maguire mm-hmm. script because I think that dramedy is a difficult, difficult uh, uh, genre. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to it, it, the critics often crush you, and it's like uh, when you get it right, though, w- when you do terms of endearment, when you do 
uh, a movie that has comedy but also has a ton of drama in it and it's about someone like jerry Maguire, like just taking a small step forward in life right. and so i love reading that script all the time because i think how he pulled that off how he created it's, a big studio a movie about a a a, 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 a sports, sports agent um is is quite brilliant um and then god um the third one that i would say because I, I read there's so many scripts that i often refer to um i i i would this is going to come out of nowhere but oliver stone uh, script for wall street oh, is very yikes. influential to me because uh he created a world he created a yeah. world that i'm very fond of he created a pace and a character and that character's goal is to make money and to be like this, this like Gordon Gecko guy who's supposed to be the bad guy, but turned into this iconic, like good guy. And so <laughs> I like, to me, when I read Wall Street, when I read Wolf of Wall Street, also another great script mm -hmm. in similar vein, they create these worlds that are so fun to live in. They're so intoxicating, yeah. even though they're sort of nefarious worlds and so i often refer to, to the wall street screenplay as well so i know that's kind of all over the place but i use those those three scripts have uh inspired me a lot well you and i are of similar vintages um so uh wall street uh in my video store days i i must have seen wall street it was a religious experience to watch wall street for me i yeah. can re i can recite the greed speech right now off the top of my head <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking you. I could go off the top of my head and read that because I just, it was such a, you, and I never really understood it, but you actually said something really uh, very poignant there that it's intoxicating. That, yeah. that world at that time was, I wanted to be Gordon Gecko so bad when I was in, a freshman in high school. Like I was just oh, like, yeah. I'm like, I started reading Wall Street books. I started reading, you know, investing books. I started like, you know, Oh yeah, I mean, I had the poster, the greed poster. There's a they they sell, they sold greed posters with the whole Amazing. speech, and I had it framed yeah. in my my room. Oh my god, it was, was like same. Alex was the same. <laughs> Wait, wait it's not just the greed speech. It's like when he's in the limo and he says, oh, "You yes. are either inside or you are outside." Yes. You know, yes. And I'm not talking about some schmo making three hundred thousand, living comfortably. I'm talking about liquid, rich enough to own your own jet. You know, as a fifteen year old. Kid, you know, <laughs> What? Oh, oh. oh it's no. a tragedy. The movie's supposed to be a oh, tragic it's... tale of a guy who sold his soul yes. to the devil yes. and pays the price. But but our generation saw it as as like a, a beacon, as this like <laughs> shining light of like how to live our lives. I mean, the funny thing is that the devil is the thing that you love the most about the film, and that's what the devil is good at. <laughs> yeah. He's good at at intoxicating and bringing you in. And uh, and I actually like the second one, Wall Street uh, Money Doesn't Sleep. I don't want to talk about that. You don't like my that one. Friend, my good friend Alan Loeb wrote it, and I love him. He's one of the best screenwriters. But it was hard for me to watch because I the first one is so perfect. Well, to it me, is it's such a perfect movie that it was just. I I don't think there was any version of the sequel that would have made me made happy. happy. It's just like if somebody made Apocalypse Now two, <laughs> I'd probably go like, I can't. I can't, I can't do it. I can't. I don't care the if first it was. Movie is perfection how, how do you top that just let it be i don't care let if coppola be. goes back in time and writes it in the in the jungle while he's shooting the first one i'm not watching yeah. it. i'm not watching no. It. <laughs> no. can't do it i can't do it now what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today very simply i have a couple mantras i live by them it's like first off you gotta be all in yeah like Playing poker, you got to look at your hand, whoever you are, if you're whatever culture you come from, whatever male, like female, binary, whatever you see yourself as, whatever you look in the mirror and identify as, you got to look at the hand you've been given and you got to say, I've got a lot to say and I'm in it to win it. And you got to put your chips in and say, I'm all in, I'm all in and I'm going to keep going until... I die <laughs> until I have a heart attack and because it is so tough. It is so 
uh, competitive. And you got to just say, I'm just like, whenever my time is, and I do feel like everyone gets their shot, um, that you got to just keep writing every day. No excuse. Just tell your stories. I don't care if it's, as Danny would tell me, I don't care if it's making a list of things you love and hate. I don't care if it's just going off book and just in your journal writing an extemporaneous scene. You've got to write every darn day. You have to, even Sundays. Like you got to just, uh, Jerry Seinfeld says he, he has a calendar and he yeah. makes sure he writes at least one joke every day. And then he puts an X in his calendar so that he looks back on the year and it's like, okay, I wrote 360, a minimum I wrote 365 jokes. So if you should be able to look back and say, I wrote every single day, and I promise you, if you do that one year, then two years, then three years, stuff will happen. It just will. You, you, unless you're just too scared to show it to anyone, then I don't know what to tell you. But right. like, if you just do it, just, just put your chips all in the middle and say, whatever this hand is I, I've been given in life, I'm all in on it. And I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to keep evolving, obviously, as a human being and as a writer, but I'm I, I, I'm in it to win it as a filmmaker and a storyteller. That would be my. That's awesome advice. Yeah. And again, it's just perseverance, man. Perseverance. Just that's it's it's a lot of times I found in this business. It's not about the, who's the best or the most talented. It's the one who just keeps grinding it out and keeps yeah. and keeps showing up. I don't love Jay Leno. I wasn't the big Jay Leno fan. But man, that guy had a work ethic. He would write he jokes on Saturdays, on Sundays, in the morning, at night. He was like, I'm not the best looking guy. I'm not the funniest guy, but I'm going to work harder than everyone else. Yep. And I'm going to just, if I can, like, like uh, I don't have that natural charisma like Letterman does, or everyone just loves Letterman. But, uh, you know, and, and my I have a lot of respect for people like that. And so... That's, these are just the people like the Judd Apatow story I said, where he'll wrote 15 jokes. There's a theme to what we've been talking about. And that's yeah. just how I see it. I'm just like, I'll put in the work. I'll deal with the rejection. And it's no fun. Look, I don't like it. <laughs> I, have <plenty laughs> of friends, I have plenty of friends who have dealt with lots of hours of phone call of me being like, ugh, ugh. But then I get up the next morning and just keep going. Yeah, keep keep it going. Keep keep the keep the keep the hustle. Keep the hustle yeah. going. <laughs> and last question: um, What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? So easy to answer that. Enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. I'm so results oriented that you can't. You just cannot be. It can't just be the selling of the script or just the, the getting the movie made or the TV show made. You got to try to enjoy the process of writing that you're that every day you get to sit there and tell your stories, you know, and some days are good, some days bad, but try your best in, in anything in life. Try to enjoy that you today. The goal is to write three pages. And if you did that successfully, go have yourself a beer or, or a nice meal or pat yourself on the back because that. How, you know, enjoy the little victories, enjoy the process, and then the outcome will be what it's going to be. I don't, I have no control a lot over that. And yes, I too, I too start having grandiose things of like, oh, maybe I could sell this for a million dollars and get it made with Brad Pitt. And great, great when it happens. I've been lucky enough to have it happen a couple times like that as a producer. But in general, things happen in ways you never saw coming. So just right. try to enjoy the process. And um, and then uh, Half Brothers is out right now as we as right we now, speak in theaters. in theaters. And then is it coming out? Do you know when it's coming out? Uh, I don't know. It will be out on VOD, Amazon, all that stuff. But it will at some it, point. And I will I will put all that in the show notes. Jason, man, I appreciate you coming back on the show. Oh man, uh, on this glad. show, first oh. time it was. An absolute pleasure talking. I know we can keep talking for at least another couple of hours. Just and and I, I'm the first one to sign up for that Danny Strong seminar that you're going to be uh, creating soon. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> that, you, Alex. Anytime.